it's Karen Foley and it's Authors Night. Today our guest is Ralph Pizzullo, as you can see from his books, an extremely prolific and talented writer. Thank you. Whose book we will discuss today is called Left of Boom, right here. It's about a young CIA case officer who penetrated the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Yes. And you're also a playwright. Yes, I am. Yes. So are these all of the books that you have authored? No, I've written, really? I think, around 20. 20? Yes. Yeah. So I, I stay busy. You do stay? How long have you been writing? Um, 25 years. Like one a year. Yeah, well, more than one a year because I, I spent the beginning of my career as a journalist and a playwright. So I've been writing. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've, I've done a lot. I've done maybe uh, a, at least a dozen plays produced in New York and London. I just had one produced in London in the fall at the Park Theater in London. It was great, great experience. What are the themes of all your? Are they all along the same? Uh, uh, I'm fiber interested. To the spine? Yeah, I'm. I'm, I, I'm interested in uh, you know people uh, put in extreme circumstances and sort of like how they react to it. And um, my plays are less political than my books, but they also uh, touch on sort of political matters, political themes. This kind of a Walter Mitty thing? I mean, are these <laughs> things that you wish you were doing? You know, I, I grew up as the son of a diplomat. I oh. was really raised overseas, so I was exposed to, uh, and my father liked to, to serve in, in hardship posts. Such as what? I mean, what? Uh, we were in Vietnam during the war. We were in Bolivia, Colombia, Guatemala, Nicaragua during the revolution. So my father liked to serve in, in uh, what they called hardship posts because it was better for his career. And he took the whole family with him? And he, he, he's, you know, where my, my parents are, are both Italian-American, very family-oriented, so he insisted on having his family with him, even in places where we absolutely shouldn't have been. And most people didn't have their families, as like in Vietnam. We were in Saigon. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a war zone, really. Fighting, you know, every night you'd fall asleep, you'd hear, you know, artillery shells and machine guns, and it was a crazy place to be. Was that but one of the most, more dangerous places you've spent your growing up years? The most dangerous place, we lived in uh, Guatemala in the 70s, and it was a time when there was uh, a very active guerrilla group that was targeting... Uh, diplomats, and uh, so that was probably the most dangerous place we lived. Our neighbor, next door neighbor, was the German ambassador named von Spreddy, and he was kidnapped and killed by the guerrillas when we were there. So you know, we knew the family, we knew his wife. It was you know very traumatic. How did that change your life style there? Were you guarded? Yeah. My father went around with bodyguards, uh, armored like convoy. Um, the kids are, you know, kind of left to their own. I was always like a pretty active person, so I could, I, you know, my brother and sister would just stay at home, and our house was guarded. But I was always, you know, running around. So I, I saw a lot of, yeah, bombings, shootings, things like that. So nothing happened to your family. You're very fortunate. We were very, very fortunate. Very, fortunate. Yeah. One, one, uh, when we were in Guatemala, uh, a member of my father's staff at the embassy was kidnapped, held, for the, held by leftist guerrillas for three days, and eventually released. But again, you know, we knew the family, and they, they were never, never the same after that. It was so, you know, so traumatic to suddenly you know, be living a normal life and then... You know, you're plucked out of it. Your your people are threatening you at, at gunpoint. You don't know if you're going to live or die, and uh, you know it's a horrible thing. But you initially uh, weren't you born in New York City? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So how long did you live there before you were transplanted? We lived there for, I think it was five years old. My father was a high school teacher, and he had a friend, uh, another teacher at the school, whose brother was in the, far, the diplomatic service. And my father met this individual and was curious about, you know, how do you become a member of the diplomatic service? And this gentleman explained that you take an exam, and if you pass the exam, you know, there's an oral exam and a panel that you go through, you have to go through. And my father took the exam and he passed and he, he made it into the Foreign Service. So uh, we left New York sort of on this big adventure. We had, you know, none of us knew what it was. I don't think my father really knew what he was getting into. But it's, uh, it's a very interesting, rich life, but difficult because... You move every two or three years, so as a kid growing up, you know, you make friends, like intense friendships in these places, and then, you know, you go, your your father's assigned to, you know, Bogota, Colombia, and their father's assigned to, you know, Tehran, Iran, you know, you never see each other again. So How does those years mold you? Um... In a lot of ways, you know, important ways, um, I think the most important was that you, I started to see, uh, like, different perspectives on, on, on political events. So, you know, I was always considered, an, I'm an American, so I was considered sort of like, a, a, like in my high school, in my school, people were always coming up to me. The schools that I went to were international. So kids would come up to me and ask me to explain what was going on in the United States. And, you know, I would avidly read the New York Times and any news magazine I could get hold of and, you know, be up to date on current events because I, I knew I was going to be asked these questions. And at the same time, I was seeing how other cultures behaved, what their history was, and how they perceived the United States which is very different from the way we perceive ourselves. And I, I think it's hard for Americans to, to under, most Americans to understand that. You know, we, we have a, a sense of ourselves and what we represent, and, you know, other countries and other peoples see us very differently. There's a saying of, we can only see ourselves as other people see us. That would be great wisdom. I know what you're talking yeah. about. Because and I think a lot of the mistakes that we make in foreign policy uh, and continue to make are, you know, based on that. We don't really understand the history, culture, and culture of other countries before we, we get involved. And it was interesting because I really grew up overseas. And I didn't come back to the States until I went to college. And when I went to, came back to college... You know, I assumed I was like, you know, I, I, I identify myself as an American. Uh, when I came here, I had tremendous culture, culture shock. I had grown up in, in different cultures. I, uh, for example, you know, I'd never seen Star Trek or like any TV show. Uh, I grew up mainly in Latin America where people are very social and you go out and, you know, the dances every night and hang out with your with your friends and I came back here and all the references were TV shows which I found extremely confusing and then when I'd see the shows I'd just be like well I don't understand like what's so compelling about Star Trek isn't it more fun to you know go out and dance and you know hang Live out with a your life friends rather yeah. than get it from the perspective of exactly. a TV sitcom yeah so it was uh, it was a, a lot of culture shock so what yeah. happened after college? After college, I was following my father's footsteps. I was going to go into the diplomatic service. I went to graduate school. Uh, I passed the exam, the foreign service exam, and I was offered a position. And at that point, I said, you know what? I've kind of already lived this life. I want to do something different, which was a big shock to my father and his friends, his colleagues. And I really didn't know what to do. I kind of drifted into journalism. I worked at the National Endowment for the Arts for a while in Washington. And um, 
I discovered along the way I had a talent for writing. Um, I moved to New York City and I became a playwright. I did, uh, I had like 12 or more pr plays produced in New York uh, and London and other countries. And I was, you know, a successful playwright. The problem was when I started, when I got married and started having children, I was basically living off of grants. Um, Jerome Foundation grants, National Endowment for the Arts grants, um, and playwright uh, fellowships. And I've, I realized, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to make a living doing this. I mean, I love it. I still do love it. But it's extremely difficult to make a living as a playwright. And I started uh, writing books and finding other ways to, you know, to make a living. And I've been fortunate to you know, make a living and a nice living as a as an author, so. Very lucky. Very well, lucky. Well, and obviously <laughs> successful and talented. Yeah, you know, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been, I found sort of, it took me a while, you know, kind of bounced around, but I found my uh, sort of what I'm, I'm good at and, 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 you know, kind of what is valuable in the marketplace. And, uh, and interestingly, you know, the first couple books I wrote were about, um, like th this one, Plunging into Haiti, is one of them. Uh, it was about the return of uh, Aristide, President Aristide, to the presidency in Haiti and all the tumult around that. And based on some of the books I wrote on my own, I was approached in uh, 2005 by this gentleman, Gary Bernson, who was a, a CIA officer, um, I just got an email from him. And basically he said, um, I'm a CIA uh, undercover operative. Um, and I've been looking for a right, researching who I wanted to work with for six months, and I've chosen you. I was like, you know, who is this guy? He says, I'm overseas, um, but here's my email, you know, get in touch with me. My wife said, you know, are you going to respond to this guy? And I said, yeah, why not? So I, I responded. Uh, he happened to be in Bolivia at the time. We met in New York and uh, it was very interesting. He, uh, we sat down and he said, yeah, I, I read all your books. You're the guy I want to work with. And I have two books that I want to write. He said, I'm the guy who took down the Japanese Red Army, which was a very nasty terrorist group in the 70s. I don't know if you remember, but they, they, they bombed and killed like 20, 30 people at, at the airport in Tel Aviv, and they, you know, they committed a lot of terrorist acts. And he said, and also, and he told me the whole story, and then at the end of it he said, I was also the guy who was sent into Afghanistan after 9-11 to, uh, you know, to, sort of stay in place and develop these teams until the U.S. military could come up with a plan to inv overthrow the Taliban. And actually, I ended up succeeding on my own with just a small group of special forces people. And we overthrew Kabul within four weeks. And we had uh, bin Laden on the run and trapped him in Tora Bora. And he was, we were at the Grand Central Station at the time, and he was getting on the train, and I just grabbed him, and I went, wait a minute, tell me, I want to hear that story. Like, that's the book that we have to write first. And he is like, oh, no, no, you, we can't. Anyway, that's the book that we ended up writing first. It was called Jawbreaker, uh, and it was a big New York Times bestseller. This book, Jawbreaker, sort of got me on the map with all of these ex-CIA officers, ex-FBI uh, SEALs, Navy SEALs, military contractors who have interesting stories to tell. And I've written a, a number of their, a bunch of their stories. What does BOOM stand for? Left of BOOM is a term that is used in, uh, it developed in Afghanistan, and it's basically uh, refers to IEDs, uh, uh, and the idea is improvised explosive devices. Uh, and the idea is that you want to stay left of boom. So you want to stay away from them when they explode. And, uh, and IEDs are, are sort of a central component 
of, of, of this story, and that's why we, we chose that title. How did you and this particular CIA agent, Douglas Lau, is it Lau? Yes. How did you two meet? Uh, again, uh, as in the case of B Gary Bernson, he contacted me, um, a, a, apparently among like CIA uh, operatives, I am, you know, I have a, a reputation because, uh, you know, my books are very accurate and kind of uh, capture their, you know, their mentality. So I, I'm approached by, I've been approached by a number of them and, you know, Doug, I met Doug in uh, maybe f four years ago. He was in Los Angeles, and he contacted me, and he said, you know, I'm staying at this hotel. I'm, a, I'm still in the CIA, but I want to write a book. And, uh, and I met him. Uh, I was surprised at how young he was. He was only 30 at the time. He's now only 33. Uh, he's a young kid from Indiana. He grew up in a farming community. Um, and he told me that on 9-11, he was, he was in school studying to be an ophthalmologist and, uh, you know, was shocked by the events of 9-11, as all of us were. And he was, he, he had never heard of bin Laden. He had never heard of al-Qaeda. And he, he, he realized right then, well, I have to, like, shift my focus and find out what's going on in the world. Uh, so he shifted his studies uh, to foreign policy, and he applied for the CIA, um, like through a website, and was interviewed and ended up being accepted. Um, and all of that process is described in the book. Uh, and then he, it turned out that he had a, a, a real talent for picking up languages, and they trained him to teach, to, to learn Pashto which is a, the language that's spoken in southern Afghanistan. Very difficult to learn. Uh, he picked it up right away. And because of that, and because of the kind of person he is, he's kind of an aggressive young man, as most CIA officers, operations officers are. Um, he insisted on being sent to like a, a war, the war zone in Afghanistan. So they, they sent him to his secret base on the uh, on the border with Pakistan, um, and he was able to, because he spoke Pashto, he dressed like a local, uh, and he he was able to, you know, communicate and be very successful with uh, dealing with the local people. Only thirty three years old, but probably a soul of a very old man. Uh, absolutely, really interesting young man. Very interesting. Very intelligent. You can just see that. As yeah. you read the book, it yeah. just ages inside. And yeah. It's very sad, but correct. It is sad. Man. It's a traumatic story um, in the sense of what he went through personally because, um, you know, he's a very dedicated um, person, as, as most of these types of people are who get into SEALs or, or CIA, um, and idealistic. And once he got in the middle of it, and he saw what he was dealing with in terms of the bureaucracy and also uh, you know, the personal uh, toll that it was taking on him. Um, it was very hard. For example, you know, he was a young man, so he had a fiance in, 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 in Washington, a girlfriend. They were planning to get married. Uh, and when he was deployed, he couldn't tell her where he was going. Uh, he had no idea how long he would be gone. Uh, what so he was doing, he couldn't say that. He couldn't tell, yeah, so uh, he had to, you know, you know, lie to her. He, he couldn't tell his, his parents where he was. So he made up a story that he was in Hawaii. And uh, because the time difference between Hawaii and Afghanistan was sort of similar. All these pictures and all the redacting. Yeah, that's something that you have to go through when... Um, all CIA officers, all uh, uh, members of SEAL Team 6, um, they all have to sign uh, like a confidentiality agreement that lasts for their lifetime. So anything they write has to be approved by the CIA. It's called the Publications Review Board. Glad there was something left. For me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very familiar with them. And um, 
when we did Jawbreaker, um, they basically told us, forget it. This book is not going to come out. Um, it's too sensitive. Um, and we had to, my co-author actually sued the CIA and uh, we had to go to court and the judge who was a Republican um, said, no, you, you know, you have to, you can take out what you don't like, but, um, you know, you have to let them, you know, publish the book. And we went through, I don't know, six or seven months of going back and forth and uh, they wanted to take things out that were we thought were ridiculous and you know it's just you know what you have to go through did you enjoy do a, doing a collaboration with these authors with these the people from the yeah agencies? usually what i do is when they come to me i i you know i basically say uh if the story if i think the story is is uh you know worthy of a book rather than you know a short uh, a, a magazine article or something else I basically say, uh, you know, you provide me with the material, you provide me with access to the people that I, I'm going to need to interview, and I, I'll do everything else. I'll write it, I will, uh, you know, sell it, I will uh, do all the editing and, you know, all that. You know, it works differently depending on the person that you're, you're working with. I mean, some people are more observant than others and better storytellers than others. Some people you have to draw information out of. Like when I was working with Gary, I'd, he'd say, well, we met, I was meeting, you know, this, this uh, Afghan general, you know, in the middle of the, the mountains. And we, we met in this house. And I'd go, well, describe the house to me. He'd go, oh, it's just a house, you know. Like, I said, well, what's the floor like? How many windows? How many, you know, so you had to kind of, you know, pull it out of him. Other people are much more, you know, observant of, of details like that. So you, what you try to do is just, you know, make it as, uh, I try to write them as, as thrillers so that they're, you know, they, in, they engage people right away. Uh, and also you have to, you know, put in enough context in terms of history, in terms of background of, of a particular conflict that these people are involved in so that you know, readers know what the stakes are. Well, the stakes are so high for these people. Yes. What is the burnout rate of these CIA operatives? It's huge. Doug lasted about seven years in the CIA, okay. and he had a he had a breakdown, uh, which is described in the book. Um, um, it was sort of a professional professional letdowns and 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 uh, personal. Uh, rejection sort of happened at the same time and it was just like too much for him him to handle uh, and he had a breakdown I mean the, the 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 transition that these people have to go through and I've it's the same for women I, I know you know women who have uh, done the same kind of work you know to be on a uh, you know, in a secret base in the middle of Afghanistan where there's... To be a target. Where you're a target and uh, where you're, you're on the, dealing... You're everybody's hit list. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, they're shelling it all the time. It's life and death. You're meeting with sources who are, you know, commanders in the Taliban who you're paying off for, for information. You're working, you know, 16 hours a day because you, you have to, you know, write up reports of every... Uh, every encounter you have with these people uh, and then suddenly to get on a plane and land in Washington DC and meet your friends for a drink at the neighborhood bar um, it's it's you know it's a transition people have a really hard time making and you know Doug uh, you know is a very honest and brave young man and oh, yeah. he kind of you know, reveals all that in the book. And, uh, you know, he would show up, uh, his, ha his girlfriend hadn't, had no warning, uh, and he, be he had been gone like two or three months, and he'd show up with a foot-long beard and super fit and tan, and she'd go, you know, ugh, you're, well, you're in great shape, but get rid of the beard. The beard is horrible. And he'd go, no, 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 I can't. I can't get, I can't shave it off. And she'd go, you know, why not? You've got to blend in. Yeah. 
because he needed it. He couldn't go back to Afghanistan. In fact, at one point he's invited to be the best, it's described in the book, he's invited to be the best, best man at a friend's wedding. And the bride insists that he shave off the beard. He shaves it off, and he, when he goes back to Afghanistan, the sources that he's developed in the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, they see him, they don't think it's the same person. They don't believe he's the same person because they've never seen him without a beard. And also, men in that part of the world Always don't shave. No. So they were like, well, no, 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 you're not the guy I was talking to before. Where's Ahmed? Because that, that was one of his uh, aliases. And he'd go, no, 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 that, that's me. They go, no, 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 that's not you. He had a big beard. Like, well, that, I shaved it off. What is the survival rate? It's not great. Um, marriages and personal relationships, you know, don't last. Uh, I've written a number of books about members of SEAL Team 6, uh, and all of them are, you know, they're on their third marriage. Um, it's really hard. Uh, I, you know, I know the guys who uh, went on the Bin Laden mission. I met them. I sat down with them like, Two weeks after the after the mission, and uh, you know they would. A bunch of them said, you know, I I deployed three hundred days that year. So three hundred days, they're away from their families. Their families don't know where they are. They're going from on one mission from another to another. All of them are like extremely dangerous. In fact, they when I, you know. I saw them after the Bin Laden raid. They were all. I was like, you know, wow, what a what an amazing thing. And they were like, eh, that was nothing. I'm talking. What about their personal mortality rate? It's very high, very high. They don't. Uh, most of them. Um, I think the average mortality rate is like fifty. You know, the average lifespan is like in the fifties. Um, yeah, they suffer lots of injuries. Most of the guys I've met, um, you know, they've got scars. They've been had multiple, you know, injuries. Yeah, it's rough, rough business. Very dedicated people. Do you enjoy this collaborative writing more than you do working by yourself, like as a playwright, etc.? Mm, you know, I I enjoy both. Really, the writing process is pretty much the same um, because uh, when I'm collaborating with uh, people like Gary or Doug, um, you know, I, I'm doing all the writing. Do you it's, do the promotion also? Uh, I do some of it, yeah. yeah. But usually, you know, people want to see, you know, the guy who actually was in Afghanistan or, you know, so, so uh, sometimes we do promotional events together, um, you know, I'm less interested in that than the writing part of it. Uh, that the, the storytelling is really what uh, you know what I love. Is it a particular type of publisher that you would go to for these books? Yeah, I have relationships, very good relationships with Little Brown um, and St. Martin's. Uh, I've done books with Crown and Random House, uh, various other publishers, but um, usually there are like certain. Um, certain editors uh, who specialize you know in the kind of material that that I write and uh, you know uh, they're always asking me like what what's next what what have you got what, who, what's your next book gonna be and uh, I tell them and they're usually like oh what you know make sure I I get that first type of thing so you know, I've been lucky to work with some great editors, and um, you know, we have good relationships. I go to New York. I live in Los Angeles, but I'm, I'm in New York like three or four times a year. I always go out to lunch with them, and they're always like, you know, what's coming up? And, what is uh, coming up? Uh, I just finished a book with a, 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 a gentleman who is in the FBI. He's been a, a undercover FBI officer for 25 years. Um, he has busted three mafia families, um, Russian mob family, 
that book was optioned by Sony uh, for a TV series before we ever sold it to, to a publisher. And that series is supposed to come out in, uh, in the fall. What's it called? Ghost. Ghost. Yeah. And he, this guy's unbelievable. So you sort of gravitate towards the nonfiction, I see. Uh, yeah, well, it depends on the, you know, on the story, yeah. I'm working on a, a fiction now, another, I do a, a book, a series of SEAL uh, thrillers that are sort of based on, uh, this, this is the latest one that came out in April, and I, there's two more. I've written six, and there are, I'm, I, I'm just finishing the seventh right now. I'm just starting to work on a, a, a story about a, a, a refugee family from Afghanistan, a father and two sons who left Afghanistan uh, after the son's school was bombed. Um, and are they, they here now or are they trying to get in? They're in, they were here this summer and they couldn't, they, they were kicked, they, they were gonna be uh, sent back to Afghanistan and they managed to escape the Canada and they got asylum in Canada. But they went on a trek that lasted a year and a half and it's just amazing. The guy, the guy left with his uh, five-year-old son and his 10-year-old son and uh, you know, heartbreaking, unbelievable. And what what's so fascinating is that they trekked, they landed in. They, first, they went to Africa. They thought they were going to get into Germany. They ended up in Brazil. They were arrested in Brazil, and then they started this trek from Brazil all the way to the United States. Uh, and along the way, they met um, all these other refugees from Africa, from Cuba from India, from Bangladesh, and it's like this caravan of people. And they, they all work through sort of, you know, coyotes, human traffickers, who help them, you know, get around border crossings, um, and of course rip them off because these people are, are just, you know, very vulnerable. Uh, it, it's, it's an incredible story. I had no idea uh, how you know how many refugees there are who are trying to get to this country? Twenty-five million refugees worldwide last year. Um, Five hundred of them made it. Five hundred thousand made it into the U.S. last year. Um, another, they estimate like another five hundred thousand were turned away. It's just, it's an incredible, you know, huge worldwide problem. And the personal stories are, you know, heartbreaking. These guys were, they were lost in the jungle in Panama for seven days. The father gave up, told the sons to go on without him. The younger son, who was like five years old, said, Dad, um, if I can make it, you're a grown man. You should be able to make it, you know, get up and keep going. And they eventually made it here. <laughs> All these sacrifices that yeah. people make. Yeah, uh, incredible. And he, his, he only took, he left one son and his wife behind in Afghanistan because the, his middle son has got, you know, a lot of health problems and he knew he wouldn't be able to make the trip. Uh, they've been, you know, separated for two years now. And it's going to be probably another six or seven months before they're able to come to Canada and the family's reunited. So it's just, it's amazing. They're no less the heroes than yeah. some of these people who you've written about. Absolutely, it's same, some of the same, uh, same challenges and, and, and you know, human courage and determination. And uh, like I said at the beginning, you know, people who are have to face uh, unforeseen, sometimes, uh, you know, challenges that they never expected, and and then you then they they find out who they are because that's when you have to really reach down into your into your soul and decide, you know, if you're going to survive and how you're going to survive, and and you meet you know amazing people. What an honor it is to have you here as a guest. Oh, thank you. You've it's enlightened us to parts of the world that all too many of us have 
too little knowledge about. And some of these people that literally, figuratively, in every way, have given their lives. Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, uh, Americans forget, um, you know, that there are incredibly brave public servants out there, um, you know, in the FBI and the CIA and the military in police forces and uh, you know they're not all perfect but they are uh, you know they put their lives on the line for the rest of us uh, and they're doing so for not for money oh yeah. never yeah no because all for these mankind, people I've spoken yeah I've spoken about you know that you know they don't they're not doing it for the money well I want to thank you very very much thank you and, it's been and a pleasure as a tribute to the people that you've written with and the people and countries you've written about. In the words of Muhammad Ali, mm. one of his quotations I've always liked the best is, the service you do to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Mm. <laughs> so thank you great. again. Thank you. And I hope our audience enjoys reading your books. Oh, thank I know you. they will. Thank you so much. And thank you, audience, for staying with us. Thank you, City of Calabasas, the Calabasas Library, and our Media Operations Department. Thank you for all of you being here with us today.